Chapter 7. Convergence and the New Urban Majorities Life Expectancy and the Expectations of Modern Life In 2008, humanity passed a significant milestone. More of our species now live in cities than outside of them. I won't even attempt to guess where exactly, other than ecological denudation, the growth of cities is leading. It could be the glimmering glass domes of sci-fi fantasy, the putrid waters of contemporary Makoko, or the jungle-immersed abandoned avenues of Mayan cities. In all likelihood, it leads in the direction of all three, and others. One suspects no one knows what the present situation is, never mind where it is headed. As Mike Davis puts it, quote, very large cities, those with a global, not just regional environmental footprint, are thus the most dramatic end product, in more than one sense, of human cultural evolution in the Holocene. Presumably, they should be the subject of the most urgent and encompassing scientific inquiry. They are not. We know more about rainforest ecology than urban ecology. End quote. The rate of change is staggering. For illustration, take megacities, those with more than 10 million citizens. While there were none in 1900, by mid-1970s there were three megacities, and between then and 2007, the number grew to 19, with the total expected to rise to 27 by 2025. That's 3 to 27 in around 50 years. Overall, since the beginning of the 1990s, cities in the rapidly developing world have expanded by 3 million per week. That's roughly equivalent to a new city the size of Bristol, Bratislava, or Oakland every single day. For now, the urban majorities look set to continue expanding as people are subject to forces that push and pull them away from agriculture and towards the freedoms and slaveries of the metropoles. While the distance between the globe's financially richest and poorest countries continues to widen, UN statistics nevertheless show incredible changes for much of the world's populations. Lifestyle shifts that are often not reflected in any comparable paradigm shift among activists in the developing world. As Hans Rowling has pointed out, the planet is often seen as divided between, quote, we and them, and we is the Western world, and them is the third world. And what do you mean with Western world, I said? Well, that's long life and small family. The third world is short life and large family, end quote. Such a simplistic picture always obscures class, cultural, and regional differences, but there was some truth to it. Not anymore. The changes in life expectancy and family size worldwide are just the most obvious changes. Alongside them are huge transformations in general health, both good and bad, child programming and the increasing degree of the commodification of social relations. Yet, even on a planet where road traffic accidents now kill similar numbers of people as malaria, the old picture still persists. In the growing cities especially, tangible social revolutions, such as the increase in life expectancy, can combine with media-propelled myths of the non-American dream to produce unrealistic expectations of modern life. Such expectations encourage attempts at assimilation and submission to power, even as inevitable clashes of class interests and the inability of the system to come up with the promised goods give rise to furies. On the positive side, many people will at least have longer lives to experience the possibility of love as well as inevitable social dislocation and widening class inequality. Divergent Worlds those that see these transformations as magically leading the species towards a convergence based on where these trends led the West would be deluded, even without the real limits now set by climate change, resource scarcity, etc. For a start, some estimate that even if one takes these trends as a given, there will still remain a rural population approaching 3 billion at mid-century. Many of these farmers, as well as many of those in the cities, will likely be living in stagnant economies similar to the countries of the bottom billion today. Additionally, many of these least converging populations are likely to be in those countries commonly described as failed states. These countries are unlikely to grow, not least thanks to additional barriers provided by the rise, or more accurately, return, of the global powerhouses of China and India. As noted earlier, the presence of these large islands of chaos brings positive as well as negative possibilities, at least from my anarchist perspective. 
It seems likely then that rather than a global convergence, we will see the continued emergence of radically divergent worlds, both between nations and within them. Additionally, sudden trend reversals in health, for example, can surprise. Just look at the unpredicated AIDS epidemic in Africa or the dramatically increased Russian male death rates in the 1990s. Within medicine and amongst elite planners, there is a widespread and not groundless fear that today's megacities and food production systems are becoming perfect incubators for pandemics of possibly unparalleled ferocity. A usable, though simplistic and therefore false summation might be that many people in the long industrialized countries tend to still hold a vision of a single third world that is far less industrialized than much of it is, whilst many in the emerging economies of the global south view their futures as far more rosy and predetermined than they probably are. And finally, those populations that, from a standard economic perspective, lie at the bottom, will in the medium future look much like they do now but we'll probably be living in less hospitable environments. The best one can say is that uneven convergence trends in many of the developing worlds will for now continue, but not universally. That there are no destinations given and the rides may be bumpy indeed, not least due to inter-power rivalry. The trends I have mentioned are simultaneously bringing much, but by no means all, of humanity together whilst breeding limitless divisions. In the ever jolly words of the US National Intelligence Agency, as well as creating convergence, quote, today's trends appear to be heading towards a potentially more fragmented and conflicted world, end quote. Survival in the slums. While different places are by nature different, one near constant across the burgeoning metropolis are the slums. At least 1 billion people already live in them, a figure expected to rise to 2 billion within two decades and 3 billion people by mid-century. This means one in three people on Earth could be living in non-formalized urban terrains in shacks, tents, corrugated iron, tenement and rubbish. Already in many countries, slum dwellers make up the majority of urbanites. 99.4% in Ethiopia and Chad 98.5% in Afghanistan, and 92% in Nepal. Bombay is the global slum capital with 10 to 12 million squatters and tenement dwellers, followed by Mexico City and Dhaka with 9 to 10 million each. Then Lagos, Cairo, Kinshasa, Brazzaville, Sao Paulo, Shanghai, and Delhi, all with 6 to 8 million. The first night I slept in a third world squatter neighborhood, I felt surprisingly at home, as I'm sure anyone who has lived in squats, especially occupations, in the global north would do. The botched electrics, the air of camaraderie, the dirt, the dogs everywhere. If the bright yellow M arches signpost the presence of corporate globalism, then shelters constructed from fading blue plastic tarps and pallets also act as global signposts. This time that you are entering squatter worlds. Waking up with chickens in your face gives the game away somewhat that you have probably woken in the third world. But having said that, it's also happened to me on site in South London. The family I was staying with were lovely and there was so much energy and creativity and resilience crammed into the shack alleys all around. I truly felt like I was in a temporary autonomous zone. A lot of what I experienced in that community made me strangely proud to be human, but those of us who see solutions as arising from autonomy, informality, self-help, and class struggle can fall into the trap of seeing what we want to see in the slums. Don't get me wrong, all those engines are present, but so too, to differing degrees, are all the predictable intra-class divisions as well as deepening class oppressions. For instance, just because it's a slum, even a squatter settlement, doesn't mean it doesn't have landlords. This often starts at the lowest level with subdivisions, roofs and rooms rented out by established inhabitants to newer arrivals. As Mike Davis points out in his characteristically amazing and frankly harrowing book, Planet of Slums, quote, It is the principal way in which urban poor people can monetize their equity, formal or informal, but often in an exploitative relationship to even poorer people, end quote. Others, from gangsters to big developers, politicians, juntas, and the middle class, also get in on the act. 
In the slums of Nairobi, for example, many of those who fall behind on rents even for a day face the terror of the landlord and his henchmen turning up to confiscate their meager possessions, evict them, and even worse. Such landlords are referred to by Kenyans simply as Wabenzi, those with enough money to buy a Mercedes-Benz. If we have said where much of the burgeoning urban majorities live, what about what they do, where they work, and where they are going? The answers are obviously hugely diverse, and I won't pretend to be able to tell you. What I will say is that many slum inhabitants could be seen and see themselves as in transition. Transition from country to urban, from refugee to worker, from dispossessed to propertied, from slum dweller to somewhere else. This narrative is as old as capitalism. Peasants, agricultural workers are dispossessed and end up in city slums. In the West, horrors upon horrors followed, eventually manufacturing the industrial worker, but not before the near century of revolutions born in France in 1848 and dying in Spain in 1938. These insurrections were largely fought by transitional classes somewhat similar to those today, who in the process of being proletarianized lived in quote, neither industrial nor village society, but in the tense, almost electrifying force field of both, end quote. While this grand tale of class evolution in early capitalism is truish, the stories playing out today are unscripted and they should not be presumed to share the same ending. While many in the slums either already work in the world of wage slavery or will end up doing so, many, many others survive in the so-called informal economy, a sector that in some cities is far larger in terms of human captives than the formal economy. Here we have a potentially explosive emergence of classes, vast in number, who are not going anywhere and seem to be surplus to capitalism's requirements. Quote, a proletariat without factories, workshops and work and without bosses in the muddle of the odd jobs, drowning in survival and leading an existence like a path through embers, end quote. Thanks to lack of sanitation, water supply and drainage, water shortages and the spread of disease are some of the greatest problems presently facing many slum dwellers. Even without massive climate change kicking in, the number of major disasters in urban areas has been increasingly rapid and most of this growth is from storms and floods. Without storm drains, the future washing away of many squatter settlements seems inevitable, cited as they often are in areas most at risk from flooding. The recuperative power of such communities is incredible. But we can presume the great floods to come are likely to exacerbate social crisis and instability. Old Gods and New Heavens By far the least pleasant experience I had in the squatter neighborhood I mentioned earlier was attending a Sunday church service. I had managed to dodge others, but this time there was no escape. The church itself was the biggest building in the neighborhood, and it too was largely built from salvage. I found it truly upsetting to see so many of the people I had spent time with venting religious irrationality, enacting inane rituals and submitting to the authority of preachers, God and scripture. The church had received some hymn tapes from a Pentecostal denomination in the USA, and thus I sat listening to hundreds of squatters who, though English was not their first language, sang out American hymns in pseudo-American accents. In fact, in the country I was in, not a single bookshop in the capital all of which were owned by churches, sold anything mentioning evolution, never mind anarchist revolution. It's easy for those of us from societies with higher percentages of atheism to underestimate the level of religiosity that is mixed in with industrialism in the global south, where, among the poor at least, they are often jointly reinforcing. Much of radical politics is religion by other means, but in the slums and amongst the dispossessed generally, the old gods are growing in stature. While sects may differ in their degree of quietism or militancy, they share an unreality that is unlikely to aid the map-reading ability of the downtrodden in truly confusing times. The wider case against religion has been argued well elsewhere, so I won't bother, but it is worth noting that while Western anarchists' most organized intra-class competitors are political groupings, in many third worlds anarchists are faced by the strengthening ranks of theocracy. That's of course in those places where anarchists do exist, which, though growing, are still not many. In contrast, religious authoritarians seem to be gaining converts everywhere, and generally, the more social dislocation, the better the recruitment. 
In Chapter 4, African Roads to Anarchy, we looked at the expansion of non-state social provision as governments retract from previous commitments, in part due to the structural adjustment and the like. Amongst the obvious pain this creates, I point to the possibilities this opens up for libertarian social forces. Unfortunately, in slums from Kinshasa to Gaza, it is religious authoritarians that are most often taking advantage of this potential to build dual or multi-power through the provision of health and general care, and this is often done alongside the build-up of armed capacity. The terrible inheritance of leftist failures and success has only left the field open for the growth of millenarian theocratic authorities amongst the slums and large islands of chaos. If much of the poor are living in hellish conditions and putting their trust in the millennium or the afterlife, the elites and middle classes are increasingly living in guarded heavens modelled on the gated suburbs of the USA. Here, Mike Davis argues, they are constructing, or more accurately, having constructed for them, Blade Runner-style off-worlds away from the disordered and dangerous worlds of the dispossessed. Whilst some such off-worlds are so off, the poor are far, far away, most are potentially within reach. Like apartheid, South Africa, or South Africa today for that point, these heavens still need workers, cleaners, gardeners, van drivers, and security guards, many of which live in the surrounding hells. As the poison oligarchs of Haiti could tell you, this, despite the CCTV, is not as safe as it looks. With such divided worlds and such divided cities, uprisings and generalized conflicts are always on the cards. Military strategists have for decades been predicting uprisings and guerrilla war in the swelling cities, and to a certain extent we are already seeing them a la the battles in Revolution slash Sadra City and the like. The combination of unparalleled income disparity, deprivation, crowding, and the spread of criminal gangs and millenarian groups is a heady mix. As a US Army think tank report puts it, distinct features of the largest or so-called world cities include marked economic and social polarization and intense spatial segregation. We also find what is probably an effect of these conditions, the large array of anti-state actors. Anarchists, criminals, the dispossessed, foreign meddlers, cynical opportunists, lunatics, revolutionaries, labor leaders, ethnic nationals, and others can all form alliances of convenience. They can also commit acts of violence and handle ideas that provoke others. Analysis the focus on a single strand of the fabric of violence that isolate on ethnic rivalry, mafias, or revolutionary cadre can underestimate the disruptive power that those phenomena gain when they coincide. Troubles will not come as single soldiers, they will come in battalions. So the militaries and militarized police forces are both fighting and preparing for conflict in the new, unmapped urban jungles. Of course, if cities were simply a negative for governments, they wouldn't have spent thousands of years ordering their construction. There are reasons why states often like to concentrate their subjects. The most famous attempt of modern militarized urbanization was that carried out by the US Army in Vietnam. Their defeat should not mask the logic of their attempt to drain the sea and thus leave the Viet Cong exposed. Wider examples of how the slums deter insurgency abound. As Charles Onyago Obo says, quote, In Kenya's case, slums, all their risks notwithstanding, are actually a stabilizing force. The pressures created by the great land dispossession in Kenya by the colonialists, which continued after independence, were partly soaked up by Nairobi's slums. Without them, perhaps there would have been a second Mau Mau uprising. End quote. Vagabond plants in urban ecosystems. Despite being tools of domestication, there are feral possibilities in the cities as almost anywhere. Their place as the exclusive terrain of power is a generalized delusion, even if it is backed up by violent facts. Nowhere is fully civilized. For a start, as the US Army theorist quoted above says, quote, the urban environment offers individual anonymity, a factor that can be of great use to the anarchist, end quote. The last two decades have seen an emergence of a third wave of anarchists in many of the world towns, Manila, Jakarta, Mexico City, Lagos, Seoul, Buenos Aires, Istanbul, Delhi, and many others, with a truly remarkable growth in Latin America especially.
Here we seem to have the beginning of a return to the flowering of diverse transnational anarchism that characterized us a century ago. This is happening as part of globalization, and the growth of cities is not surprising given that the seeds of social movement anarchism are largely carried around the planet on the coattails of capitalism and often grow best like weeds on disturbed ground. As Richard Maybe has put it, civilization divides life into, quote, two conceptually different camps, those organisms contained, managed, and bred for the benefit of humans, and those which are wild, continuing to live in their own territories on more or less their own terms. Weeds occur when this tidy compartmentalization breaks down. The wild gate crashes our civilized domains, and the domesticated escapes and runs riot. End quote. Earlier, we looked at some continuing, if besieged, anarchies which continued to live in their own territories on more or less their own terms. Even though from birth most of us in the cities have been contained, managed and bred for others' benefit, possibilities for escape are often present. There are cracks in the pavement and our growth can lever them wider. In most places, by doing so, we are unlikely to destroy the concrete utterly, but we can open up more spaces in which to grow together. In some senses, vagabond plants are on the other side. They are living in opposition to the city, yet they are simultaneously part of the overarching urban ecosystem. To see them in isolation without implicitly seeing their links and interactions within the wider community would be foolish. The same can be said of those of us with feral ambitions. As urban anarchists, we are both consciously other while intricately within the wider ecosystems, both human and beyond. Anarchists all over the urban world are growing their own countercultures whilst actively fighting in wider social and ecological struggles within and alongside striking workers, indigenous peoples, in women's organizations, migrants, slum communities, and countless others. However, one only needs to look at the recent repression faced by anarchists in Chile and elsewhere to remember that being grasped between the cracks is dangerous. The weed killer is always on the way. Practical international solidarity is sometimes helpful, but it will be the vigor of the plants themselves and how suitable their environment is that will primarily determine whether they take hold. If as many theorists of elite power fear, the fast-expanding, largely unplanned cities of the global south are fertile ground for the growth of anarchy, the age of the megacities will be interesting indeed. What rebellions await? What ideologies will be concocted? How will humanities feel and see themselves following this massive disconnection from the land? Will all these cities remain at the end of the century, or are they a transitory bloom? Long live the weeds and the wilderness yet. We have briefly looked at the expanding urban monocultures, but what of their opposite, the besieged biodiverse wilderness? How will climate change, conflict, civilizational expansion and contraction affect them? What can we, the weeds, do to defend the wilderness?